If you take any corporate finance class in college or grad school, one of the first concepts you're going to learn about is the net present value or NPV analysis and how to use that analysis to make decisions on an investment opportunity that you or the company that you're working for might be considering. And because of this, when people enroll in Break into CRE courses or the full Break into CRE Academy program, they sometimes get thrown off when they take a look at the models we build in the training and find that the NPV metric isn't used much or really at all, and instead, other metrics like the internal rate of return or IRR are prioritized in the templates instead. The NPV and IRR are both unique in that these are time value of money functions where cash flows received earlier on in the analysis period are worth more than those same cash flows received later on in the analysis period. So both of these metrics can be used as helpful decision-making tools when analyzing and valuing commercial real estate deals. However, the difference between these two metrics is where things can get tricky and deciding which of these two figures to use and why can sometimes be pretty difficult to understand. So to answer a frequently asked question that you might also have when you see the core concepts of your corporate finance 101 course, maybe not being as applicable to real estate investment analysis as you might have hoped, in this video, let's break down what the IRR and NPV each actually are, how these two metrics end up playing together from a real estate standpoint specifically, and why the IRR tends to win out when it comes to real estate finance and valuation. So like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, both the NPV and IRR metrics are unique because these are time value of money calculations, meaning that these return metrics factor in the exact timing of each cash flow in the analysis in order to calculate returns. This essentially means that a $1,000 distribution received by an investor today is worth more than that same distribution received a year into the future because that $1,000 can be invested today and earn more money for the investor during that year, but also because that $1,000 will inevitably lose purchasing power over the next 12 months since inflation will usually eat away at anywhere from around 2 to 3% of that value each and every year. And with the NPV and IRR both factoring in inflation and reinvestment rates into the equation, these metrics both end up being really helpful tools to measure all in returns from both operating cash flow and sale proceeds on a real estate deal. But when you hear about these time value of money equations in finance or learn these formulas in a textbook, this is where things can start to get a little bit fuzzy since the textbook definitions tend to be pretty abstract and difficult to apply in practice. So in this video, to put some context behind both of these metrics and understand what each of these figures is actually telling us, let's run through a quick refresher of what each of these metrics measure in a way that goes beyond just basic textbook definitions and into real life. So in their simplest forms, the IRR and NPV analyses allow investors to understand the time-weighted annualized returns on equity invested in a project based on a series of projected cash flows the property is assumed to generate. So for example, let's say we're analyzing a single tenant retail property currently being marketed for $10 million and we plan to purchase the deal in an all cash transaction with our closing costs amounting to $100,000. Now let's also say that the property is on a long-term triple net lease with annual net operating income of $500,000 starting in the first year of ownership. Now from there, let's also assume that we plan to sell this property at the end of 12 months for $11 million this time with $300,000 of these sale proceeds going towards our costs of sale and our brokerage commissions. And to analyze the deal we're taking a look at, we wanna know after we sell, what the total time-weighted annualized returns to investors will be, and this is where the IRR and NPV come into play. So let's say that for this deal, based on the risk we're taking on, we would need to see a 10% annualized time-weighted return on equity invested in order to make the deal worthwhile, and we wanna use both the NPV and IRR to calculate our return. And if we start out with the NPV metric, the first thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to select a discount rate, which in real estate is really just equal to that targeted annualized time-weighted return, or really that 10% figure that we just mentioned. 
And in this case, if we assume a $41,667 NOI generated each and every month and an $11 million sale at the end of month 12, if we use Excel's XNPV function and a discount rate of 10%, we'll get a net present value of the cash flows equal to $102,000. $392. But again, out of context, this number doesn't really mean anything unless you put it in real terms, which is where the NPV analysis really starts to get powerful. So if we were to apply this number to our specific deal scenario, that $102,392 figure actually tells us that based on our projected NOI and sale values, we could invest an additional $102,000 $392 of equity into the project. And even with that additional investment, we could still hit our annualized time-weighted return target of 10% in this case. And in a scenario where our return target wasn't 10%, but maybe was instead 12%, this number would now be a negative $75,000 $832, now indicating that we would actually need to reduce our equity investment by this figure in order to hit that new target annualized 12% return. In either scenario, the NPV really helps investors understand the exact dollar figure they'll need to increase or decrease their total equity investment by in a deal in order to achieve a specified return that they're targeting on the project. Now, with all of that said, the NPV is helpful in these types of scenarios, but again, this isn't usually directly included within real estate financial models used by major institutions and private equity firms in the space. And instead of an NPV analysis, most of these firms will focus on the other metric we mentioned earlier on in this video, the internal rate of return or the IRR on the project, which is directly related to the NPV metric, but ends up being shown in a very different way. And to start out with the textbook definition of the IRR, this is just defined as the discount rate at which the net present value of a set of cash flows is equal to zero. But again, this doesn't really mean much out of context. And again, similar to that discount rate, what the IRR really represents is just an investor's annualized time weighted return on equity invested, which makes this metric a very easy benchmark to track. And for investors, a very easy metric to compare to other investment vehicles like stocks, bonds, or other private equity investments they might be considering. And because this metric is so easy to compare to other investment options, real estate firms will generally raise capital around investor IRR expectations specifically, which often makes this the preferable metric to use within a real estate financial model to analyze and value commercial real estate deals. So on that same deal we mentioned earlier on in this video with that same cash flow timing, if we were to use Excel's XIRR function this time to calculate our returns, we'll get an IRR of 11.14% or 1.14% higher than our discount rate back in that NPV analysis. And similar to the NPV, this metric is telling us that the project will exceed investor return expectations based on the projected cash flows on the deal, since obviously 11.14% is greater than 10%, and this is often much easier to present to investors than an abstract NPV with a specific dollar amount. Ultimately, because this metric is so commonly cited in investment memos and is often actually used as a benchmark to calculate promoted interest in real estate syndications or funds, the IRR metric tends to be much more commonly used in practice than the NPV calculation, even though at the end of the day, these two metrics will both get you to the same conclusions around your target return metrics on a deal that you're analyzing. So I hope this was helpful in understanding the difference between these two metrics. And if you're looking for more information on which real estate investment return metrics actually matter most, how to calculate each of these metrics and how these returns are each applied out in the field, make sure to check out our all-in-one membership training platform, Breaking the CRE Academy. A membership to the Academy will give you instant access to over 120 hours of video training on real estate financial modeling and analysis. You'll get access to hundreds of practice Excel interview exam questions, sample acquisition case studies, our entire library of pre-built acquisition, development, and waterfall models for multifamily, office, 
retail and industrial properties, and you'll also have access to private one-on-one -on -one email-based career coaching if you're looking to break into a top real estate private equity, brokerage, or lending shop and want some additional personalized feedback along the way. And if you found this video helpful and want to see more content on this channel around real estate investment analysis concepts and return metrics, make sure to hit the like button to let me know. And let me know in the comments if there are any other metrics you commonly hear talked about in the industry that you'd like to see covered in a future video. As always, thanks so much for watching guys. I hope you found this helpful. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already to see more videos like this every single week. And I'll see you in the next video.